Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our critical forests, wetlands, and streams with the belief that some land is so beautiful and rare, it should be protected for public benefit forever. Today, more than 8,000 acres and 45 miles of trails are open to you and I to enjoy 365 days per year thanks to their incredible vision. The urgency that drove our founders continues today as we accelerate our efforts to strategically protect and restore more fragmented forests, to expand and connect our existing preserves, and to create new preserves all the while building out infrastructure in parking lots, trails, and signage that allow access for public for the public while also protecting these incredible ecosystems. Nature Hour is a virtual education and lecture series with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community and regional partners. We have three additional Nature Hours this spring, including trees, farming, regeneration, and climate with local legend Dale Hendricks of Greenlight Plants on March 9th and Bicycling with Butterflies with Sarah Dykeman, author and founder of Beyond a Book on March 23rd. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support and tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Stoffers of Kissel Hill, Dart, Ratu Associates, Penstone and Nimblest. Thank you to these companies for your commitment in supporting Lancaster Conservancy's work. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Williams, who is our Community Engagement Coordinator with the Lancaster Conservancy. He is an outdoor educator, naturalist, writer, and photographer who especially enjoys exploring the often overlooked parts of our natural world. He has a BS in Environmental Biology from Kutztown University and MS in Ecological Teaching and Learning from the Leslie University Audubon Expedition Institute. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Fritz. Thanks, everybody, for being here on this uh, really nice, warm Wednesday, February night. Let me just pull my presentation up. So this time of year feels kind of like this. But pretty soon, the energy is going to shift to something like this. Here in the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock Indians and before them, the Shanksbury people, we're blessed with this amazing rush of energy and color that just seems to burst from the ground uh, in, in, this, in this short explosion of life. And, and so we call these, these beings, these flowers, these plants uh, ephemeral because from our human perspective, they, they last for just a short amount of time. You know, basically between uh, when the forest floor thaws and the, the canopy leaves out, um, all this happens and then they just go away and they die. Uh, but it's really a misnomer because what's not obvious beneath the forest floor in this picture is all the energy that's been stored up by those plants in that short window when they're above ground, in their roots, in the rootstocks, in their corms, in their bulbs, uh, depending on, on the species of plant. And all they're waiting for is this. Just that right amount of sunlight to start hitting the forest floor and warming it. And they've developed this amazing strategy so that in between that time when the forest floor thaws and warms and the forest canopy leaps out, they do all their living, right? They sprout, they grow, they flower, they reproduce. They produce sugars and starches that they store in the roots to get them through the rest of the year. And then they senesce and they go away and they die. 
And so from our perspective, from our limited human perspective, you know, we call them ephemeral because to us, they only last for a month or two. But from their perspective and a more ecological perspective, these are extremely long lived beings. And they just have this incredible strategy that they've, de they've developed over the last, you know, 30 some million years to survive and have become really successful at it. And one of the plants that is so prominent and, and often the harbinger of this amazing explosion of color are Virginia bluebells. Um, Virginia bluebells form these, these huge expanses of just incredible violet, intense blue color. Uh, in fact, the blooms get more intense in color with time, right? So these plants have a really difficult time self-pollinating. Uh, their pollen is located deep in those trumpets. It doesn't shake out very readily to, to self-pollinate other flowers. And so they really depend on pollinators to do that job. And those pollinators could be, you know, usually it's an insect of some kind, but it could be more than insects. There are mammals that, that pollinate as well. Um, and so as time goes on, those, those uh, Virginia bluebell blossoms get more intense blue to attract pollinators because they're desperate to get pollinated. It's a pretty ingenious, an ingenious system. Um, and, you know, and they really, they just fill the forest with color. Uh, and and it, I've ha I haven't visited the Vincent Van Gogh uh, immersive uh, uh, museum exhibit yet. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for it to, to open back up in DC. Um, but I, I imagine being in that immersive Van Gogh exhibit to be similar to what I feel when I'm at Shanksbury in the middle of this amazing bloom of, of uh, Virginia bluebells. Just such an intense purple and blue to the point where you can, you can almost smell and taste the color. And, and then there's other plants that come in and add texture that to that whole color palette. Like we've got these, these beautiful cream colored whitish blossoms coming in there. You can see these underneath the bluebells right here on the bottom. These are trillium, uh, nodding trillium specifically. Uh, and there's a couple of different trillium species that inhabit the, the, the Susquehanna Riverlands region where a lot of our preserves protect these beautiful flowers. Um, and so you're, you know, you're bopping down the trail at Shanks or at Kelly's or Clark or any of those other Riverlands preserves that Conservancy protects. And you're just enjoying the intense colors from the, the, uh, the, the, the bluebells and the whites from the trillium. And all of a sudden, off in the distance, you see that red, that intense red. And you're like, huh, what's up with that? And you get a little bit closer. And lo and behold, it's stinking Benjamin, <laughs> stinking Benjamin trillium. And so, you know, whoops, there we go. So you notice that that deep red maroon color really doesn't fit in with the rest of that color palette. Um, and the name stinking might, might kind of key in that uh, that flower is actually pollinated by flies. And so the name stinking Benjamin and the color of that, it, it's supposed to mimic and look like, you know, rotting flesh and smell, smell similarly so that these flies come in and, and, uh, and pollinate. So, you know, who'd have thought that a fly would be, have the important job of pollinating? And fly, flies in and of themselves are these amazing, fascinating animals, but maybe that's a, a topic for another, another nature hour. Um, and then we have these Susquehanna trillium, right? So trillium flexipes, and actually flexipes is also the, uh, the specific name, right? Trillium is the genus, flexipes is the species of nodding wake robin or bent trillium or drooping trillium, all the same common name. Um, but we're really not sure what's up with Susquehanna trillium. This is one of the neat conundrums of our area, but you see this really deep, intense red core right here. And then we've got these white flowering bracts around it. And so it looks like it's a cross. We think it might be a cross between, you know, stinking Benjamin and nodding trillium, um, but it does have the scientific name of trillium flexipes. Either way, sorry, you stink, right? And this is a pretty neat um, strategy that some plants have developed to get pollinated. And so, you know, from, again, our human perspective, when we think of a wildflower and we smell really pretty fragrances and things like that, um, that's how we think, you know, we, we, uh, those plants attract pollinators, but there's this whole other group of, of plants that use an opposite tactic. And that is to smell kind of nasty, like stinking, nasty from our perspective, not if we were flies, if we were flies, we'd be loving these plants, right? Like stinking Benjamin and, and like skunk cabbage. And skunk cabbage, for some reason, rarely gets included in the spring ephemeral club, just not cool enough of a plant to be considered a spring ephemeral, but it is. In fact, they're one of the first things to burst out. This picture was taken at one of our preserves. In fact, it was Climber's Run uh, last February after a snowstorm. And these uh, skunk cabbage hoods, right? These spades actually produce heat to melt snow. And so this, this melted area around those, around those skunk cabbages were done by those plants. And inside those hoods is this spadix, right? This alien looking egg thing that's covered in tiny little flowers that guess what? They stink and they attract flies for pollination beyond the coolness that these things are poking up and melting snow and ice, which, you know, here at Climbers, we had one 
up through uh, an ice sheet on one of the, the vernal pools uh, as early as the first of February that was melting ice to, to come up and start doing its job, which is really cool. But then, you know, in a couple of weeks, the whole um, uh, bottomland forest floor, that whole floodplain is just going to be covered in these huge, green, beautiful leaves that, yeah, if you crush them up and, and you know, and uh, break them and step on them, which we don't want you to do, but if you happen to do that, it'll smell skunky, which I kind of like the smell of skunk. So it's plants for me. Um, and then we've got some other more traditional, uh, um, traditionally considered spring ephemerals, like these trout lilies that are actually named for the leaves. So if you look at the modeling and the coloration on these leaves, they look a lot like the side of a trout, a lot like the side of a brook trout, uh, which you know, are, are the only native trout that we have in the East, by the way, but that's a whole other story for another one. Um, and these are amazing plants. So in order for this trout lily to produce this flower, it has to be at least seven years old. So right there goes out the window, the idea that these things are ephemeral, right? That plant is at least, at least seven before it can even become sexually mature and reproduce with a flower. The other part of this is only one third of the trout lily colony is gonna produce flowers in any one given year. And that colony can be between two and 300 years old. Um, and they're pollinated by a, an assortment of pollinators. And so oftentimes when we think of pollination, we think of the European honeybee. Um, obviously imported to North America, it's European, right? Um, certainly the European honeybee plays an important role in pollinating our food crops, but a more important role in pollinating wildflowers and our food crops are native bees like this digger bee and this, uh, this beetle, a longhorn beetle. So yeah, beetles pollinate, right? Not just bees, but beetles are doing some pollination here. Uh, and then Dutchman's breeches. This is a really, really cool early season uh, spring wildflower. And so it's named because of the way the flower is shaped, right? You see this, this kind of V shape, right? It looks like pants, breeches hanging from a line. Um, and uh, they've got these deeply toothed leaves that'll come in uh, as a, an interesting diagnostic characteristic here shortly. Uh, what's, what's not obvious in this picture also, besides all the energy that's stored just beneath the surface in terms of you know, uh, roots and corms and tubers, are uh, queen bumblebees, right? So queen bumblebees are mated in the fall and then they, they're the only survivor of their colony. They find a place to overwinter. Usually it's just beneath the surface of the soil, often beneath fallen leaves and brush piles. And so, you know, one of the things that we can do, every one of us, uh, to improve our ecosystem function, uh, the integrity of our ecosystems and biodiversity is leave the leaves. It's such a simple, simple thing. It's just when the leaves fall in the fall onto the ground, leave them there. And this is one of the big reasons why, right? Those queen bumbles need that protection from those fallen leaves and those light brush piles in order to survive the winter. So this mated queen is hanging out beneath the surface of the forest floor right there with all that stored up energy from all those wildflower uh, corms and rootstocks and bulbs just waiting to emerge, but she needs food. And so the timing of her emergence happens to coincide with the emergence of Dutchman's breeches. She's starving. She just spent the entire winter estivating. She needs nectar and she needs pollen and she needs it now. And she needs it not just for her survival, but to provision the next colony that she's gonna form, right? So bumblebees are, uh, depending on the species, this particular is an Eastern bubble, are, are form small social colonies, not big, big hives like you see when we think of a hornet, but small social colonies. And this queen is gonna get nectared up and pollened up and then find a, a burrow to go and start you know, lay her eggs. And those are gonna be her workers that start the next colony, but she's gotta get provision first. And this is her tongue sticking out. You see that proboscis sticking out of the front of her, her, her mouth there, her head, that's her tongue. And she's just in a hover, just nectaring on, on that Dutchman's breeches flower. Um, there's no tongue. Whoops, too much. There's tongue. See it? These are really long tongued animals. Again, co evolved with this plant over 33 million years to be able to get the nectar out of that flower. Now, this is a reciprocal relationship. And I think, you know, that's one of the things I want to really point out in this, in this presentation is the reciprocity here. Um, the bee is getting nourishment, right? She's getting nectar and she's getting pollen for her and her babies and her future colony. Uh, in, in exchange, the, the Dutchman's breeches are getting fertilized. They're getting pollinated so that they can then have, have babies and offspring. It's not an extractive relationship, right? The bee isn't just taking anything, something from the, the flower, the plant, without giving something back. It's reciprocity, it's reciprocal. And I think if, if us as humans took that concept to heart and thought about how we can be reciprocal with our landscape, 
right, with our world, with our environment, I think we might get further down the line in solving a lot of the environmental problems that we're facing today as a species. Um, and it's just, it's so cool to watch this relationship play out before our eyes every spring between the queen and her britches. And there's her tongue again. And so this plant sometimes is confused with this one, right? This is squirrel corn, also dicentra, right? Same, same genus as the, uh, as the Dutchman's breeches because they've got these deeply uh, toothed leaves, right? Uh, divided leaves. But you can see the difference in the flower. These are really heart-shaped, uh, whereas the uh, Dutchman's breeches are obviously, you know, they look like pants hanging on a line. And another little white flower that sometimes gets confused, although this one's really different, right? If you look at the leaf shape of this, this is a, a cut leaf toothwort. It looks like the leaves are cut. So it's a great common name. And the toothwort actually, the toothwort name actually comes from uh, the rootstock. So if you, if you were to dig up the root, which we don't want anybody to do, uh, because these plants won't survive when you dig them up. Um, but if you were to do that, you would see that there were structures along that, that rootstock that, uh, that looked like little, little teeth. So all of those plants that we talked about so far uh, depend on ants to, to disperse their seeds. And so 30 to 40% of woodland spring wildflower seeds are planted by ants. And this is another amazing ingenious strategy that these plants have developed. The plants attach a little packet of sugar or fat called an eliosome to their seed. And that sugar or fat attracts the ant because they wanna eat that sugar and fat. And so they grab the, that eliosome, which happens to be attached to the seed and they lug it back to their colony and they eat the eliosome, the fat or the sugar, and they're, they're, you know, they're happy and you know, they got full bellies. And then they either leave the seed in their colony or oftentimes throw it out with the trash, which happens to be a really well-churned, highly fertile patch of soil. So this plant seed just got planted by ants after they got done eating the eliosome, which the plant attached to the seed to facilitate seed dispersal. So think about the strategies these plants have developed. Right, So not only have they developed a strategy to take advantage of a limiting factor of sunlight by really rushing their life history, their entire life cycle into like a one or two month period where they emerge, they flower, they, they reproduce, they store up sugars and starches in their, in their roots to make it through to the next spring. Right, so that's strategy one. Strategy two is they develop these really complicated um, pollinator relationships to ensure that they get fertilized, that they get pollinated at the right time, in the right way, by the right organism. And then they attach sugar and fat to their, to their, to their babies, to their seed, to their offspring, so that the ants take their babies and give them the best possible place to grow and sprout roots. And they're just plants. These are beautiful. Red columbines, one of my favorite, man. I grew up in a, in a place in Bucks County, right on the, on the Delaware River, and these were growing up along the Palisade Cliffs. Um, just a really, really cool plant. That's where we find them growing on our preserves here in, in the Riverlands. Um, they like really, really rock. They like rocky outcrops. Uh, and the red columbine is uh, the host plant for this beauty, which is a columbine dusky wing, which is a kind of a skipper. So skippers are not quite butterflies. They're not quite moths. They're considered butterflies. The, dust, or the, uh, the columbine dusky wing skipper is a critically imperiled organism in the state of Pennsylvania. Used to be really, really common through the entire eastern U.S., and it's now in, in a steep, steep decline. Um, and it is entirely the caterpillar of this, of this beautiful uh, insect is entirely dependent on columbine, right? So columbine dusky wing skippers depend on columbine plants. Um, spring beauties, um, should be seeing these any day now, I think. Really pretty dainty little looking flower with these, these nice creamy, uh, almost uh, faint purple petals with uh, pink venation through it. Uh, and these are uh, pollinated by these digger bees. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, a specialized pollinator uh, is this digger bee, uh, an andrenid bee. And if you see these, these pollen sacs, um, look at the pollen puffs on the back legs of this digger bee. So a lot of bees have a specialized structure on their back legs called a, a pollen basket. And you can see all that, that pink pollen just looks like cotton candy that it's collected from, this, uh, from these, these uh, spring beauties. These aren't the only pollinators of this as usual, right? Here's a beetle, don't know what kind it is, doesn't really matter. The cool thing is that there are multiple pollinators to this amazing system that's been evolved over you know, 33 million years. And here's a ground beetle. Never thought ground beetles were part of that, uh, that pollination system, but um, it really is mind blowing the more we look into this and how things work. 
And this is a re another really cool one. This is a mayapple. Mayapples are some of the most alien looking things that we have in our forest, right? So this umbrella looking plant has this leaf that's this umbrella shaped. And then the blossom before it flowers looks like the mouth on that plant on uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Remember that guy, feed me, Henry, right? That, that mouth, that's exactly what that, and I think whoever wrote Little Shop of Horrors, the genius that they were, I think they spent time in the woods looking at these plants and that's where they got the inspiration for that, that I forget the plant's name. Isn't that terrible? I should know that character's name um, for that, that plant that was eating people. Um, but that's the blossom right there when it opens up. I don't have a good picture of the one with them when just like a mouth. I'll have to work on that for next year. Um, but here we are again, that plant right there with that open blossom is at least four years old. May apples have to be four before they are sexually mature, before they, they're able to reproduce. And, and that's reproduction. Being able to flower is reproduction. So again, another one that kind of blows the idea of ephemeral uh, out the window. Um, and I'd, I'd really be remiss if I didn't include uh, flowering shrubs as part of the color palette of, of the season that's about to start here in a week or two. Um, and this is spice bush. And so spice bush is a native bush that gets these really pretty yellow flowers on it. And it gets these cocoons every once in a while. This is actually a cocoon of this beauty. This is a spice bush but, uh, swallowtail. That spice bush swallowtail caterpillar that is in this cocoon right now that's gonna emerge as an adult before it was uh, pupating, it was a caterpillar that it was entirely dependent on spice bush uh, in order to survive. And that result is this beautiful uh, uh, spice bush swallowtail that right here is nectaring on a Turk's head lily, which is not a spring ephemeral. This picture was taken at one of our preserves in July. Um, and I would be really, really remiss if I didn't include this fan favorite that has a cult following almost, a growing cult following. You can, you can brew beer out of it apparently, uh, pawpaw. Um, and this is another spring flowering shrub. And it has these deep maroon, pretty small, maybe an inch, 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 uh, inch wide uh, blossoms. Guess what that deep maroon blossom is supposed to smell like? You guessed it, rotting flesh. Although when I smell pawpaw flowers, I don't smell rotting flesh, but I'm not a fly which apparently this fly really likes a lot. And the pawpaw is the host plant to this beauty, a zebra swallowtail. We got a couple of, of non-natives that trip people up. And so I included them in this just to kind of help folks ferret out native from non-native because we get, when we're, when we're doing interpretive events and we have volunteers working our, our uh, uh, outreach table at Shanks, we get questions about these particular plants a lot. And so these are Star of Bethlehem, and these are not native, but these helictid bees, these sweat bees, love, 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 love the nectar and the pollen there. I mean, this one's looking like, man, what a party that was as <laughs> it's crawling out of there. But look how covered in pollen that thing is. Uh, just it's, Even though it's not native, it's beautiful. And I don't think this is considered invasive. At least I haven't seen it take over uh, places. So the difference between non native and invasive, right? Non native is not from here. And then invasive is not from here. And well, it, doesn't, it can be from here. In fact, we have some native plants that tend to take over uh, ecosystems when they're not managed right. So invasive is a plant that just kind of launches and takes over and eliminates biodiversity. Not that I'm proposing that we, we go and we plant Star of Bethlehem everywhere. I'm not saying that at all. Plant native, plant native, plant native. But on a scale of harmful things, this to me is on the lower end of harmful compared to some other things that we're dealing with. Um, same thing with speedwells, right? Speedwells aren't from here. In fact, I saw my first speedwells in bloom today. Pretty little blue flower. Uh, and that's being pollinated by a hoverfly right over here. Not a bee, looks kind of like a bee, but it's a fly, another dipterin. And uh, Scylla, and we see quite a bit of Scylla at uh, Shanks Ferry from time to time. Again, not native. And the violets are kind of this tough, this tough group. We've got a bunch of violet species that are native to here. We've got a few that aren't. Um, they're really pretty, uh, violet, viola species. We've got some white violets, we've got yellows. We've got a couple different species that are blue and violet on the spectrum. Um, and this beauty is a regal fritillary that depends entirely on native violets as it's, you know, for its caterpillar is the, the host plant is native violet. Uh, and these are critically imperiled in the state of Pennsylvania. Yet again, here's another one in our lifetime that might go away um, and because the violets are going away. The native violets and the habitat that this organism needs uh, is getting turned into this. Uh, the regal fritillary needs uh, more of a prairie open woods edge ecosystem and that's prime development. And you know, this two acre patch isn't gonna support any violets. It's not gonna support any uh, Dutchman's breaches for the bubble bees. It's not gonna support any columbine. 
um, for the for that um, uh, Columbine dusky wing. It's not going to support uh, any of the beauty that we saw. Right, that's gone. And this this regal fertile area is really just an example of what's going on globally. Uh, so if you look at this living planet index, it's a measure of biodiversity. Anything above one indicates increasing biodiversity. Anything below one indicates decreasing biodiversity. And this is, again, this is a really rough estimate. And this is only looking at vertebrate species globally. It doesn't even include invertebrates like the, uh, the, the dusky wing or the regal fritillary. And you can see that we're in serious decline right now. And when we look at the reasons why we're in serious decline for both the, the vertebrates, but also the invertebrates that we track are following the same trend, right? Uh, we're losing insects, we're losing um, crayfish, we're losing a bunch of you know, uh, freshwater mollusks, um, uh, mussels. Um, so this trend, even though this particular graph depicts vertebrate trends, certainly holds for inverts. And when we look at the reasons why, it's this, it's habitat loss because of development, because of destruction, habitat destruction. That's the number one driver on biodiversity loss. And it's happening here, right? We've got that, that Columbine dusky wing and we've got that regal fritillary are both critically imperiled in the state of Pennsylvania. This is on our watch, in our backyard. This is another reason, invasive species, right? We talked a little bit about that a minute ago, how invasive plants get into an ecosystem, take over and eliminate other organisms, other, other, the, the other diversity. And this is a big one uh, in our region anyway. So we've got all these, these white blossoms that you see through here. Uh, at the end of these stalks. This is um, garlic mustard. And uh, this was really threatening a lot of Shanks Ferry wildflower preserve. And thanks to the hard work of our stewardship team and our volunteers, we really, um, I don't wanna say we have it under control, but we certainly knocked it back quite a bit. And last year was the first year, uh, I've been visiting Shanks, I think for 20 years now. And last year was the first year where I actually felt encouraged that garlic mustard wasn't gonna outcompete all the native stuff there. Um, and again, that was thanks to the hard work of people that cared enough to spend some time pulling that stuff out. We have another one, and this one's really scary. This is celandine. So you see this, uh, these yellow blossoms here and here, and there's the dicentra right in the middle, right? Dicentra, the, uh, the Dutchman's breaches. Uh, celandine forms these monoculture stands of nothing but celandine. It's a prolific cedar. Uh, the bulbs of this thing are tiny, like pebble sized. And so when you go to dig something up like this, you can never get them all and you leave one behind and it produces a big colony. And because it's a prolific cedar, if you don't do your removal, if you don't time your removal just perfectly right, all you're doing is spreading seed all over the place. Um, and so this is a, a real threat to our, our biodiversity. And so are we, um, and I'm guilty of this, right? I love taking macro pictures. Most of the shots in this were mine, not all of them. A good friend of mine provided some of them, um, but I'm guilty of this, right? Well, I'll be at a, on, a, on, a, on a preserve and I'll see this beautiful insect or plant that's just a little bit too far away for me to get a clear shot. So I'll just take one step off trail. It's only one step, right? Well, you take that one step from me and you multiply that by the 200 people that visit Shanks Ferry on a given Saturday uh, during wildflower season and multiply it by their two feet because everybody's, you know, most people have two feet. Uh, and all of a sudden that's not just one step anymore. That's a lot of steps. Um, and, and we do damage unintentional. We do damage unintentionally this way. We leave our dogs off lead. They do harm in so many ways. They trample vegetation to begin with, right? So all those stalks that, that spot here are, is, and I'm not an anti-dog person, I love dogs. I got two of them at home and this is an all-time low for me. Normally I got three or four, um, but I don't let them run off lead on a preserve. <laughs> so when they're running through wildflowers like this, they're really doing damage by snapping the stems of those flowers, right? And those flowers are the reproductive structures of that plant. And so you're reducing the population, uh, the, the ability of that population to increase through seeding. Uh, because when that flower snaps off, if it's not pollinated and it's done its job, it doesn't produce seed and that plant's done, it doesn't have a chance to reproduce. That's number one. Number two is pet waste is really, really bad um, for a number of different kinds of plants. Um, it's not good fertilizer um, and leaving it behind, uh, especially when you leave it in a plastic baggie, um, it just, you know, it's not cool. Um, and having a dog off lead, um, as your dog is, is running up to somebody barking its head off and you're saying, they're friendly. Yeah, well, that person doesn't know that. And so the person that was on that preserve, their experience is kind of diminished now. So, you know, bring your dogs out to the preserves. We love having dogs on preserve as long as they're on lead. And plant theft is a thing. Who'd have thought, right? We, we stopped labeling plants at some of our preserves because people were stealing them and digging them out. 
Um, pretty funny story about uh, an incident that happened at Shanks Ferry last year. I was down there digging out celandine, that, that little yellow plant that we show you, that, that invasive, right? And, and anybody that knows that area uh, uh, of, of Peckway knows the, the, the drunk highway, right? So there's an access road that runs along the tra railroad tracks and it's not open to the public, it's railroad property. And it's really significantly signed that way. Um, and it's for railroad maintenance equipment. Um, but people can, you know, people use that to avoid detection by law enforcement apparently. And that's how I got its name, Drunk Highway. Um, and so I'm down there one day, uh, middle of the week, middle of the day, and I'm digging out Selendine, and there's this beat up old pickup truck traveling down the drunk highway in Peckway, and, and the truck stops, and the window rolls down, and they're like, hey, you need to stop stealing them plants. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, hey, thank you. I work for the Conservancy. I'm getting rid of this invasive, but man, thanks for keeping an eye on the place. I really appreciate it. Really restored my faith in humanity. Um, you know, and so any of those things that we do, right? One step off trail onto that trout lily that took seven years to get to that point, at least seven years to get to that point where it could flower, part of a potentially two to 300 year old colony snapped. Your dog runs through that or does something worse and much more disrespectful on it, done. A house goes in on that site, somebody steals it. That plant's opportunity for making babies is over, right? And potentially its life is over. This only has about a month to photosynthesize enough sugars and starches to store in its roots to last it for the other 11 months until it has the chance to shoot for the sun again. And so it's those, those kind of decisions that we make that we don't even consider as a decision that can have a really negative effect, right? So we need to start thinking about um, some of those unintended consequences of things that we really think are, are so subtle and innocuous and, and uh, uneventful, as simple as just taking one step off trail can be pretty devastating from the perspective of that plant and all the other life that depends on it. And, 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 and that's, these are some of the, that's, this is some of the life that depends on it. These are all critically imperiled in our state, right? We already talked about the regal fritillary. This is a rusty patch bumblebee. This is an American bumblebee. Bob is Pennsylvanicus, by the way. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. It's got our state name and scientific name and it's going away. Um, and then here's the frosted elephant, right? All of these things are critically imperiled in the state of Pennsylvania. And this, the, this, the rusty patch is federally endangered um, and, and we're losing them. Uh, and here's an example of that. We are making decisions to have the rusty patch go away forever in my lifetime. And the Belleville Prairie is a good example, all right? So this is not our region. This is in Illinois. It is a 25 acre patch of uh, gravel, a remnant gravel prairie, really, really rare ecosystem. One of the last 25 acres of intact gravel prairie that we have left in the world. And it happens to be right next to the Rockford uh, Airport. Rockford Airport wants to put a new runway in for cargo um, at the expense of habitat for the rusty patch. We know the rusty patch is on that 25 acre site. There are other organisms that you don't find anywhere else, but getting that runway in so we can facilitate the shipment of Amazon stuff is more important. We're, we as a culture is saying that's more important um, than the existence of this species. And it comes down to the effect that it's gonna have on us, right? I mean, we can, I can sit here and list out all of the ecosystem functions and benefits that all the things that we just saw do for us. We are intimately tied to this biosphere. We're a part of it. And when it fails, when it falls, we fail, we fall. But beyond that, all of the things that we talked about have intrinsic value. They have the right to be on this planet as much of a right to be on this planet as we do. Um, and so we need to stop the loss just based on their intrinsic value on top of the fact that when they go away, we go away. You know, and so it's been this, this 33 million year old relationship that we're talking about between these beautiful plants that are about to uh, what are, uh, appear to burst from our forest floors, right? Knowing that they've been storing up energy and planting this for, well, if plants could plan, right? But you get what I'm saying. This doesn't just happen like that, right? Their physiology has been getting turned into gear. And especially after a day like today, it was 60 degrees here at Climbers and the sun was out. And I'm like, Wait, these things are gonna erupt any minute, right? But, but it's this 33 million year old relationship between those plants and their strategies and the insects that they depend on and vice versa, right? The plants depend on the insects, the insects depend on, on the plants. And so, you know, I, I welcome you and I, I, I encourage you to go to Shanks Ferry this spring to see this amazing burst of color. 
or any of our other riverlands preserves for that matter. Shanks just happens to have probably one of the best collections, but you know, Kelly's Run, Clark, um, Turkey Hill, uh, climbers, all of them are just incredible with wildflowers here in the next two weeks or so is, is when this flush is going to start. But I, I challenge you though, to, um, to instead of running through the preserve with this beautiful uh, checklist that, that Kelly put together, this field guide that, that our amazing communications team put together, instead of running through that preserve with this kind of energy, I challenge you to take a break, pick a spot on the trail, don't sit off trail because you crush plants, and find a queen bee who's checking out her britches and take a pace to this. take that slower pace and you just sit and watch that 33 million year old relationship between the queen and her breaches play out. Think about what your role is in this and let that inspire you to keep it wild. So thanks for spending part of your Wednesday night with us, everybody. And special thanks to Dr. Chambliss for use of some of her beautiful uh, wildflower photos. Thank you, Keith. I, for one, cannot wait for the explosion of life. And we're getting closer day by day, especially with this warm weather. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who is here in attendance, if you have any questions, please throw them in the Q&A box. I see there's some in the chat that I'll try and cover here as well. Uh, but so Keith, starting out, what what is it about places that like Shanks Ferry that make it so prolific for spring ephemerals? Yeah, well, Shanks Ferry is, is a neat one because the geology drives it. So there's two different geologies that kind of come together there. So we've got some limestone that underlies part of it, and then we've got some schist that underlies a different part of it. So that, that helps facilitate a lot of the diversity of the plants that we see there. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's the rich soils that lie on top of that geology um, that, uh, that facilitate um, all those plants. And it's been protected for a long time. Right, so I believe the history of that is PPNL had that protected before the conservancy got it, and so it's really had a long history of protection, which facilitates those flowers still being there. One question we had was, what's the best time to visit places like Shanks Ferry, Fern Cliff, and some of the other wildflower preserves that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a hard one. Usually, you know, you, it seems to peak right around Easter, but it really depends. It changes every time you go, almost daily. I mean, it's such a fast progression that you start out with, with um, you know, like bloodroot is one of the first ones to emerge. And then after a week of bloodroot, the bloodroot's gone, and now you start getting uh, some bluebells coming up. And so you can visit those preserves almost daily for that two-month time, and every day will be different. You'll have a different cast of characters that are up. But typically, it seems, and again, it's so variable based on weather, it seems like right around Easter is the peak of color for most places. Some questions about the invasives that you mentioned with the with the celandine. When is the best time to remove that? Oh yeah, great. Coming up, in fact, um, we're keeping a close eye on it. We're waiting for some stuff to emerge, and so really, uh, as soon as it emerges, as soon as you see these waxy um, these waxy green leaves, is the time to, to to remove it. And and the way to remove it is to dig it up and make sure you have all the little bulbs. So it's very time consuming to dig it up, but coming up pretty soon. Could you also talk a little bit about garlic mustard, why it's so important to remove that? It's prolific. Someone commented on the fact that it's pretty prolific at County Park. And of course, as you pointed out, we're focusing on it at Shanks Ferry, but what, what's the, the reason for the cause of removal? Yeah, so it's a really prolific seeder, right? So each one of those uh, shoots produces thousands of seeds. Um, and then it just outcompetes uh, native stuff for space. Um, I'm not sure if it's allelopathic, it sure seems like it. So a lot of times, uh, things, uh, uh, invasive plants have allelopathic properties. Basically, it's, it's chemical, chemical warfare between plants. It's like this herbicide that um, uh, inhibits the growth of other, other plants, uh, other natives. And so, but really the, the biggest threat that I saw at Shanks with, with garlic mustard was just, it's so prolific and it's such a, a big cedar 
you know, produces so many seeds that it can easily outcompete our natives for sunlight because it's it's shooting for the sun at the same time that our native plants are, and it's taller than them. Um, outcompeted for sunlight, nutrients, and moisture, and space. Um, the other thing is it's a biennial, right? It's not a perennial. So if you get it in the right time before it goes to seed, you're effectively wiping, you're, you're putting a, a break in the cycle. Um, and so it's, it's one of those where timing is critical um, and we've got about a month to grab it. And after that, it's kind of pointless because we're just spreading the seed around. Someone did ask about the celandine, if there's, a, if there's another way to remove it other than pulling it from the ground. There, you know, I've heard reports of weed eating it, but you gotta be careful when you do that because if you do it after it's seeded, you're just gonna spread it. Question about uh, leaf removal. When is the best time or when during the spring season can we finally start to do some of our cleanup? Yeah, great question. Usually after you get about a week of 50 degree days, it's pretty safe to start doing some of your garden cleaning. You know, uh, uh, general, you know, it's a, it's a general um, a good practice to leave all your stems tall through the winter time, right? So your garden looks a little bit unkempt through the winter because there are stem nesting native bees that, that, uh, and other insects that use those hollow stems for homes in the wintertime. But after a couple of days of 50 degrees, most of the things that were either estivating in those stems or were hanging out through the wintertime as eggs have either hatched or have moved on and they're out and about and making a living. And so it's usually safe to clean up some leaves and clean up your garden after a week of 50 degrees. To answer someone's question, Keith is the rock star that fills <laughs> our bird feeders and keeps our bird camera rocking and rolling. So thank you for asking. He is a superstar in that realm. <laughs> and along those lines, people are wondering, are we going to be doing any educational engagement at Shanks Ferry as part of uh, the Conservancy Outreach this spring? Yeah, we do have, I think we have four hikes planned. And so if you go to the event page on our website, you can, uh, you can find out information about those hikes. And I'm sure uh, on our follow-up email, a number of people have asked, is this recorded? Many of you know it is. Uh, in our follow-up email, we'll send and include some links, which will include the event pages for all upcoming nature hours, uh, as well as our spring engagements. Uh, I think, uh, Keith, you said somewhere between 20 and 25 in-person in engagements uh, between now and the end of April. So it's gonna be a really busy spring. Uh, for all of us and uh, we really appreciate the level of knowledge you bring to the organization and um, just a fantastic presentation. So thank you for being here this evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Hope to see you out on the trail. One of these beautiful nature preserves this spring. Please stop and say hello and uh, have a great evening. Be well. Thanks Fritz. Thanks everybody.